Hello, and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero. We have come to the penultimate issue of Nintendo Power's first eight year, issue five, for March and April of 1989. Well, a lot of ground to cover, let's get started. Our cover for this issue features Ninja Gaiden from Tecmo. The cover is fairly disappointing. The backdrop is pretty plain, and the ninja... <laughs> oh boy, the ninja. First, this guy is clearly... Clearly a white guy. Did Nintendo of America not have any Japanese or Asian people of any variety working for them who could dress up like Ryu Hayabusa, a Japanese character? Also, what in the nine hells is he holding? It's not a throwing star. It's not a sword. It's not even a set of nunchucks. What is it? Are they afraid that if they had the ninja holding a weapon, they'd get complaints from parents like they did for the Castlevania 2 cover? What the hell? Also, our mail column has been moved to the front of the issue now instead of the back. We have a letter from a group of residents from a retirement home who are big gamers who remind us that video games were never really just for kids, so take that, critics of video games. The walkthrough of Zelda 2 continues in another article, and I, as I said everything that I had to say last time, I'll just leave it at that. We then have our CES report. So, well, it's 1989, so instead of E3, we had the winter and summer consumer electronics shows, and in this case... Well, we're talking Winter CES. The article is written somewhat from the perspective of Nestor, and we get a very brief rundown of what each of the companies at Nintendo's booth were displaying at the convention. Aside from the various games on display, one peripheral gets a particular fo degree of focus, and that is a new controller, the Power Glove. I am now contractually obligated as an internet critic to use the following clip. I love the Power Glove. It's so bad. Here we go, our cover title, Ninja Gaiden. We get a rundown of the various special moves and power-ups in the game, as well as some very nice art. That said, is it just me, or does Jakio look like he has antenna in the art? We have maps for the first three areas, as well as descriptions of the game's cinematic cutscenes. While the cutscenes are great, and I've always had a spot, soft spot for games on the NES that tried to do more from a narrative standpoint, as this game, get, game did, I do have to disagree with Arena's assessment of Ryu from his playthrough of the first Ninja Gaiden. He really is a terrible ninja. That said, moving on to the gameplay, Ninja Gaiden is one of those games which Arena of Game Center CX managed to beat legit with a lot of time, a lot of work, and the help of his talented assistant directors. I, at present, have not beaten the game legit, instead having beaten the Super Nintendo release of the game from the Ninja Gaiden Trilogy Collection, using an emulator, and save scumming. Anyway, this is one of those games that's put in the category of fun, but incredibly hard. The difficulty is due basically because the game makes a calculated effort to throw enemies at you exactly where you least expect them, or can't really work around them. For example, if you're jumping forward in a tricky platforming sequence, or by spawning repeat enemies when you're trying to grab a power-up item. All this combines to keep the player on the move and to keep the pace and tension up. This is helped by the controls generally being incredibly responsive, with the jumps being almost perfect, and weapons having exactly the amount of reach that you need for the circumstances. That said, if you watch the Game Center CX episode where Arino takes on Ninja Gaiden, which I'll put a link to in the show notes, the Japanese version of the game is slightly easier than the US version. For example, in that version of the game, I believe Ryu is able to climb up walls, while in the US version, once you make contact, you're stuck there until you jump off, with the wall climbing ability not being introduced until Ninja Gaiden 2. Still, you should probably pick up this game and give it a shot. It's definitely worth your time. Next up is Hudson's Adventure Island. Who oh boy, of all the games I've encountered thus far that were featured on Game Center CX, this is the first of the ones I've come up against where Arena wasn't able to beat it. Aside from the usual power-ups, we have maps of the stages from the first area of the game. As far as the game itself goes, I'm not a fan of Hudson's Adventure Island. The game actually, in spite of everything it has as apparent on first glance, doesn't feel like it has that much character. Sure, there's Master Higgins with his bass, with his grass skirt and his baseball hat and his skateboard and stone axe throwing, but other than that, the world feels kind of bland. This game isn't helped by the fact that you have to unlock the ability to use a continue code. 
And near as I can tell, not only is it incredibly easy to miss the item that triggers it under normal circumstances, if you die once for any reason before you get to it, then you can't get it at all. Further, I never quite rocked how to perform jumps of varying heights. Normally in a console game, the longer you hold down the jump button, the higher you jump. However, I really can't tell if that's the case here. And I've played this game a bunch, but it just doesn't seem to work for me. I would just recommend skipping this game, frankly. Now, most of the issues thus far have had fold-out posters of various games that will get covered in later issues of the magazine, and this issue is no exception. Normally, I don't discuss these posters because the art usually isn't very good, and what's more interesting is the stuff on the other side. Um, usually, maps for the game in the article immediately prior. Well, in this case, the art is different, as we have some very nice art for the NES release of Strider, and I want to point this out. We also have an article discussing Strider next. Now, with this issue, Nintendo Power has kind of started dividing its feature articles from its preview articles, and we're now getting into the preview coverage. But not all of the games that get previewed get featured, so I'll still discuss the games getting these sort of in-depth previews as well, and then still kind of giving a brief gloss over for the Pack Watch and other similar columns. We get a rundown of the game's power-ups, as well as a map of the first stage of the game. Now, Strider for the NES is one of those games that are part of a major franchise, or semi-major franchise, which gets a fair amount of crap. This is because, from a graphical standpoint, the game is far inferior to the Sega Genesis and arcade versions of the game, and the game shifts the gameplay to a sort of weird mix of Mega Man and Metroid, with the main character going through a variety of levels, collecting items and power-ups, which will ultimately end up unlocking new levels, or areas of old levels, and you just basically go, basically go through the game that way. It's also more cutscene heavy as well. That said, the game isn't without its problems. Um, the jumping animation in this game is kind of wonky, particularly in comparison with the Genesis and arcade versions, and this is particularly notable whenever vertical scrolling gets involved in the game. Also, the game's level up system is kind of iffy, as it's not clear what it takes to level up your character, aside from reaching arbitrary checkpoints. Also, this game includes the ability to do a triangle jump of the quick button, quick time to button press variety as opposed to something like Ninja Gaiden where it's jump to the wall, stick, jump to the next wall, stick, and so on. And it works basically like most other triangle jumps, like what you get in Super Metroid, but honestly, I don't think this game executes it as well. I found it very difficult to pull off the triangle jumps. But it's still worth mentioning that it has these this particular mechanic in there. Still, there are things I like about this game. As I mentioned, the story in this game is much more significant and much more a part of the gameplay experience than the story in, Str in the Genesis or the arcade versions of the game. And apparently it attempts to adapt the story of the first Strider manga, Strider Hyru, which is published before the game came out. So I definitely recommend giving this game a look-see, and possibly picking this up if this sort of Metroid Mega Man style gameplay is the kind of thing that you're interested in. I've been considering doing review some reviews of unlicensed and out-of-print anime and manga for quite some time, and playing this game really makes me want to hunt down the original manga and check it out. Some of the issues, some of the Tankoban, the trade paperbacks, have been translated. I'll probably download some of those and give it a look. It sounds like it could be interesting. Um, we'll have to see. I'll let you know when I get to that. Next up is Cobra Triangle, and if you thought we were going to make it through an issue of Nintendo Power without reviewing a game by Rare, well, here's our Rare title for this issue, which is published by Nintendo. Cobra Triangle is one of those games that's interesting. It's a racing game with weapons, like RC Pro-Am, but it's got a power-up system like the one from Gradius. However, it's kind of more simplistic. RC Pro-Am had a wider variety of courses and tracks of increasing complexity as you went through the game, while Cobra Triangle kind of has a repeating loop of different variety of missions, each ending in a boss fight against some sort of giant animal, with the intermediary levels somewhat varying depending on which circuit through this sort of conceptual loop there is. The controls are generally pretty good, the boats control how you'd expect a power boat to control. From a difficulty standpoint though, the game does have a problem of basically 
giving you an effective god gun in terms of the homing missiles which seek out any enemies on stream. Thus, with a controller that has a turbo button, like the NES Max with Advantage, you can just turn on turbo, hold it down, and basically cheese the game. Still, it's fun, and I definitely consider it worth picking up if you're interested in getting more racing games to expand your collection. This is a single player title, though, so if you're expecting a certain degree of multiplayer, you'll be kind of disappointed. Here I go. Entering the realm of the Spoony one again for this next game, The Adventures of Bayou Billy. The article gives us a rundown of the various fighting and shooting stages of the game, and ugh, this game, this freaking game. There is nothing about this game that Spoony doesn't say in its review that I don't agree with in every possible respect. This game is a Abysmal. This is a disgrace to video games. I could sit here and reiterate every single point that is wrong with this game, but I'd be covering the exact same ground as Spoonie's review, possibly with less profanity. But I don't want to do that. I've been putting a link to his review in the show notes, and instead I'll just talk about the one thing that he didn't bring up that possibly might... I don't know if it's in game favor or what. In short, from a premise standpoint, Bayou Billy had potential. If this game were to be remade now, where we're not, where game developers aren't restricted by the limited um, content well, restrictions that the, the Nintendo of America put on their on developers and publishers back in the day, this could have a lot of stuff done with it to make it an interesting game. Um, particularly nowadays, where we've had the Grindhouse collection, it's gone beyond a double feature to including films like uh, Hobo with a Shotgun. And this we got a game that kind of took advantage of that and in a better way than something like Wet did. Where, it could, where, I mean, if you know anything about sort of the exploitation film subgenres, even if you're not like a big follower of it like Brad Jones is, you'll know that like back in the 70s um, and probably the 60s, we had the, sort of the biker exploitation genre. Um, and a bit of the redneck exploitation genre. Um, some films that kind of tied into all this were like the Billy Jack series, the early installments where you had the sort of half Native American drifter taking on biker gangs, protecting peaceniks, and you beating them up with this kung fu. Um, and we could have gotten something that kind of tied into that, had the sort of Billy Jack style martial arts, possibly have it involve a sort of boss hog-esque um, like a, a truly malicious boss hog-esque -esque antagonist as opposed to being boss, boss hog is a, is a villain and Duke's Pastor is a villain certainly but I wouldn't exactly call him sinister an actual sinister antagonist would mean for an inch, would have made things better um, much as the game has and have it kind of tie into all of that and give Biobilly a sort of Billy Jack style character or Possibly make him a little more swoop, smooth and suave, like uh, Gambit from the X-Men. Um, at the time, of course, the game couldn't have featured any of this content, because, sure, for, I mean, Nintendo's content restrictions, huh, they're just, yeah, some, I mean, the more edgy and artistic and interesting stuff visually, oftentimes it's based on either, if they're, if they're not visually impressive because of technical stuff, like with Ninja Gaiden, it's impressive and if they're daring, it's because of what they managed to slip past the sensors, like Mar like Monster Party. Um, but yeah, this game came out now. If someone were to, make, to remake this game or reboot the franchise now, I could really see this game done with a sort of grindhouse feeling. Possibly, hopefully done unironically, and done in the fashion that makes for an interesting game but also which has a real sense of character and flair to it. However, because this game turned out as poorly as it did, I feel like it tainted the well for the franchise, so that we really couldn't get a game like this now, or get get the, a reboot now that could do the premise what it deserves. Not what it deserves, but do the premise justice. Because this game doesn't. And, honestly, that's kind of the biggest disappointment about Bayou Billy, is the potential squandered. So we continue in the realm of Konami with the first Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle game, which also takes me back into the realm of games that have previously been covered by the Angry Video Game Nerd. 
the article has maps of the first two areas of the game, the city map and the dam map. This is a game that is almost good. The platforming is iffy, with the jumping ability of the characters working against them in some places, and further, as the angry video game nerd mentioned in his review, the fact that the hazard in the sewer platforming areas is water is highly questionable. Further, the balance of the characters isn't great, as in this game, the only characters really worth using are Leonardo and Donatello. Donatello for reach and power, and Leonardo for speed and being able to hit a wide area. However, the real problem with this game, is the, or biggest problem that I've ever encountered, is the second half of the dam level, which has the turtles having to make their way through an area of water underneath an unnamed dam near New York City, where the turtles have to defuse a series of explosive charges, all while avoiding electric seaweed and various booby traps that I presume have been placed there by the Foot Clan to prevent people from defusing the bombs, all within a five minute time limit. I've done this as far as actually completed the task from beginning to end without getting a game over a sum total of once, and even with the assistance of emulation and save scumming, I still wasn't able to succeed in defusing the bombs for this review's gameplay footage. The issue is made worse by the fact that there is no ability in this game to save your game or enter a password, meaning that if you have to stop playing the game, you could, you, you will have to go through this level all over again. If the underwater level wasn't there, this game would be significantly better. But it's there, there's nothing I can do about it except tell you, hey, probably shouldn't play this game, or maybe if there's a way to get around this using a level select code, using that instead. Next is Counselor's Corner, and unfortunately, they replaced the really car cool cartoon doodle at the top of the article with something far uglier. Of notes here is the hints for Zelda 2, where we get information on finding the town of Kasuto. Also, in Howard and Nestor, we have more coverage of Zelda 2, with Nestor learning that Howard haunts his dreams, or perhaps is trying to perform an, an inception. In classified information, we get a level select code for Gogo 13, which unfortunately does nothing to make the game suck less. We also get the continue secret for Hudson's Adventure Island, which I tried to take advantage of when recording gameplay footage. And I'm still kind of glad they printed it here, but it doesn't make that game better either. In the top 30 column, we have, well, we have Blades of Steel entering the top 10. Woohoo! Below the top 10, we have Mega Man 2, Rampage, and Bubble Bobble entering the list. Then we have the Power Pad Playoffs, which is a rundown of titles that have come out for the Power Pad. And, well, frankly, because I can't use the Power Pad with my computer, I'm not going to review any of these games. In the Video Shorts column, we get some fairly notable titles, including California Games and Nobunaga's Ambition. Under NES Journal, we have the magazine's April Fool's joke as, well, this is kind of dumb, considering the magazine came out in March, not April. Um, Slowly Profile has Shane McCall on here, on here, who used to appear on Dallas, but left the show in 1988 when this issue was published, and took up modeling until she retired not long after this issue came out, and she's still retired, so, yeah, that's a thing. Finally, we have the rundown of the nominees for the Nintendo Power Awards, their annual awards for best games and characters and so forth and so on, and I'm putting the ballot up on the screen right now, so take a look at that. Go ahead and freeze frame this and decide, well, who would you want to win these various categories? And post your thoughts in the comments, and we'll discuss the results with the in the next episode. Sadly, there are no multiplayer games this issue, so there's only one pick um, that I can, I'll be giving, and that is for Ninja Gaiden. The game plays very well, and while it's hard, it's not sadistically hard. And honestly, I mean, it's a game that's changed the way storytelling is done in video games. It has cutscenes. It has cuts, uh, basically the, the, well, the 8-bit equivalent of the pre-rendered cutscene. Um, before we got the sort of sophisticated in-engine, we got the, before in-engine cutscenes as we know it kind of came about, um, and rather than just having them being used for bookends, an opening and a closing, like with, for example, games like, um, well, Blaster Master from earlier, 
I can speak from earlier issues. Um, Ninja Gaiden uses these cutscenes, these dramatic, actually melodramatic cutscenes, to tell an interesting, if certainly flawed, story. And there's a lot to be applauded for that. I've always felt that even if ambition in storytelling or in making a game, whether it's like mechanical or narrative or whatever standpoint, even if it fails, it's still worth to, worth applauding it because you because I want to see more of it. I want to be, see more people push the limits and be ambitious and try new things or do things in ways that they perhaps haven't been done before. And this game definitely handles storytelling in a way that hadn't been done before it come, came out. And I strongly recommend people, if you've never, ever played the original Ninja Gaiden, you really should pick it up. It's definitely worth a shot. Now again, if you've enjoyed these videos, uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel or Blip.TV channel and give this video a thumbs up or love on the um, respective locations. Um, next time, we'll get to the last issue of Nintendo Power's first year, issue 6, and after that, we're going to spend a couple of issues talking about the best of the rest. Not issues, but a couple of videos talking about the best of the rest. The games which were featured on the top 30, but which did not get covered in the magazine. What stuff perhaps the Nintendo Power editors didn't feel was worth mentioning, or what have you. But games which managed to get a following of some sort or another anyway. We'll talk about those next time. Or rather, in two episodes. But until then, I'll see you on the on ne the next episode of the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. <laughs>